I'm originally from India. I moved to this country in July of 1997 to a predominantly Indian neighborhood. Me and my sister nicknamed it Brown Town. <laughs> Which I'll be honest with you guys, is a joke that was much funnier when I was eight years old. <laughs> this neighborhood was very Indian, though. It was very Indian. Well, this neighborhood was so Indian that I didn't see a white person till September. <laughs> And I didn't know I was in America till Christmas. <laughs> so October. <laughs> I don't blame my parents for doing that, right? I don't blame them for moving me to that neighborhood. Moving to a different country as a child is very difficult. It's a hard thing to do. New environment, new friends, new schools, right? It's a very scary thing for some uh, people to do. They wanted to make sure that we weren't going to be shocked by all that American culture we might encounter. <laughs> You know, all that culture that's been stolen from everywhere else to make that melting pot. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted to make sure that we were kept safe, right? They wanted to make sure we were comfortable. They wanted to make sure that we were kept in a bubble. And I am against living in your own bubble. I think a lot of us have lived in our own bubble for far too long. And I think it's about damn time that we started stepping out. Stepping out of your bubble can be amazing. Right? Stepping out of your bubble can make you realize how beautiful this world really is and the ugliness of how we've all fucked it up. <laughs> and you look, stepping out of your bubble can help you learn some shit. That's what I want to do. I want to learn as much information as I possibly can. But I made that mistake. Stepping out of your bubble's hard. I made the mistake of just sticking to my own bubble. Right? When I go on tour, I like to tour these college towns. All right? College towns are fun. College towns mean there's some intellectuals there. They're going to be drunk, but they're still intellectuals. <laughs> There's always this other part of this college town that's a little bit forgotten, right? A part of this town, they used to make shit with their hands. Real blue-collar shit. Makes for some very interesting conversations. Makes for some very interesting to the sightings, too, you know? I was in Muncie, Indiana recently. If you don't know where Muncie is, it's about an hour north of Indianapolis, Indiana. Very small little college town, Ball State University. That's what's there. And I was driving around Muncie, looking at some one-story houses, and I pull up to a stop sign. And right on the other end of this stop sign was a house with a big-ass Confederate flag. <laughs> yeah, it was like a tapestry of hate. <laughs> a literal false flag of discrimination. And the two men working in the front yard were, of course, shirtless. <laughs> I don't know if you know this about the Confederacy or not. Not only did they lose the war, but they also lost their damn church. <laughs> and right next to this big-ass Confederate flag was a big-ass American flag. <sighs> Guys, one of those flags strongly disagrees with the other one. <laughs> If those two men could step out of their bubble, maybe they could see the hypocrisy of their front yard. <laughs> but none of this information should have shocked me as much as it did, right? I should not have been as shocked as I was. Because if I would have stepped out of my bubble, I would remember that the state of Indiana once elected an open Klansman as their governor. <laughs> yeah, did you guys know about this? His name was Ed Jackson, 1926. He ran on an open clan ticket and won the governorship of the state of Indiana. Yeah, that must have been one hell of an inauguration, wouldn't it have been? <laughs> Probably the first and only inauguration done in all robes. <laughs> and I'm sure they took their hoods off when they played the national anthem. <laughs> Come on, guys. They're racist, not rude. Isn't that ridiculous? Ran an open clan ticket, won the governorship in the place state of Indiana. Didn't get impeached. He served out his four-year term. Yeah, did not get impeached. At the end of his term, though, he was disgraced out of office. Not for being a member of the clan, but for bribing the former governor of Indiana to keep his mouth shut about clan dealings. Yeah, the state of Indiana basically looked at this man and said, Hey, 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 you say whatever the fuck you want about black people. But you keep that bribery shit out of our state. <laughs> this is an honest, racist government. <laughs> we will not have you sully it up with this bribery bullshit. You're embarrassing us. That's the kind of shit I want to learn. Right? When you learn that kind of shit, the hope is you don't repeat it again. It's the hope, isn't it? I think stepping out of your bubble can be really hard because I think we've been taught 
to live in our own bubbles, right? I think we've been taught since kindergarten. I think there are some great lessons you learned in kindergarten, right? You learned sharing is caring. Treat others the way you want to be treated. And for the love of God, Billy, get the goddamn crayons out of your notes. Gotten off the blood circulation to the brain. And then immediately you're thrown into gym class where you have to pick a team, right? You're either on Becky's team or on Jenny's team. And if you're on Jenny's team, you beat the shit out of Becky's team. <laughs> and we're definitely playing two of the most violent gym class sports ever invented, dodgeball or kickball. So we never really get to practice sharing is caring or how to treat one another when we haven't even graduated kindergarten, right? Can't see the nuances of other people's belief systems. Well, because nuance is a first grade idea. <laughs> That joke is usually for about four people in the crowd. <laughs> Carries on through the rest of our lives, doesn't it? Think of how we make our friends. People with tattoos will go hang out with other people with tattoos because nobody's asking them what the fuck their tattoos mean. <laughs> and then people without tattoos just wish we were cool enough to hang out with people with tattoos. You do it in coffee shops too, right? Go to any coffee shop, and you will find one area where all the smokers hang out, puffing away at their cigarettes, judging everybody on the inside for not getting enough fresh air. <laughs> I will stand like this till everybody laughs at that fucking joke. It's one of my favorite lines I've written. <laughs> Do it with peanut butter, too, don't we? Peanut butter, of all things. It's either creamy or crunchy. And by God, if anybody says creamy, I will burn this place to the ground. <laughs> goes all the way down to our families, right? That's how small this bubble culture really gets. Some people are closer to their moms, dads, sisters, and we all have one member of the family. That's just a little bit too racist. <laughs> yeah, using terms from the 30s no one said in 70 fucking years. <laughs> just like, come on, Uncle Lenny. It's 2017. Update the hate vocabulary, huh? Get with the times a little bit. My dad's that person for me. Yeah. And my dad is a man that literally lives in his own bubble. He won't leave the apartment, except at 7.30, on dot, he will go to a bar after watching 8 to 12 hours of Fox News. <laughs> yeah, y'all let that go ahead and marinate in your brains for about a minute. So I've had 29 fucking years to let that be in my head. <laughs> I do love that thought, though. I think that thought's really funny. Just that thought of my, uh, my immigrant dad bitching to a bartender about these Mexicans that keep coming in here trying to steal our jobs, seize and guns away. <laughs> it's fucking hilarious. Because that bartender is most probably Mexican. <laughs> well, I mean, he's Honduran, but my dad doesn't give a shit. <laughs> Neither does he know the difference. My dad's a big suburb guy, right? Uh, he lives out in the suburbs. He doesn't like venturing into the city very much. When he does come into the city, he won't leave his car anywhere. He's scared of leaving his car because he's afraid of the crime that was invented by black people. Okay, he read that on a ticker on Fox News. <laughs> when my sister used to live in Pittsburgh, she lived in a predominantly Jewish neighborhood, right? She lived up in Squirrel Hill. Yeah, so when she would see my parents, when she'd go to home to visit, my dad would have to drop her off because she didn't have a car. And my sister would have all the shit in her hands, right? She'd have all a bunch of the stuff. That, that's like a mom thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. I can go to my parents' house with nothing in my hand. I'm leaving with, there with some shit, right? Yeah. I'm leaving there with, like, baby photos that I don't need. Newspaper clippings that have nothing to do with my family. Regrets. You know, real heavy shit I don't need. She's got all this stuff in her hand, and my dad refuses to get out of the car to help her with her stuff because black people. <laughs> and that is a quote. <laughs> <sighs> Just because Hasidic Jews dress in all black doesn't make them black people. <laughs> Living in his bubble has made him fail at racism. <laughs> you understand how depressing that is? I've tried, man. I really have. I've tried talking to him, right? Introducing him to some new ideas. He doesn't have to agree with me. Just listen. That's all I want, right? I even tried changing the channel to CNN, you know? It's still a garbage news network, but it's something fucking different, you know? 
But he's too stuck in his ways. He's too comfortable doing what he's been doing for a long time, right? And that's the challenge in all this. How do we get these people to care? On both sides of the aisle, how do we get these people to step out of their bubble and just listen? That's all I'm asking for. I'm not asking for love. I'm asking for listening, right? A lot of people look at me and they go, Chris, you're, that's a fruitless endeavor. You're beating your head against the wall. You're never going to get people to listen. You're never going to get people to cross-contaminate their bubbles. I disagree. I think we've already cross-contaminated our bubbles. Music is a great example of how we've cross-contaminated our bubbles. I'm a big rock and roll fan. You guys like rock and roll? Woo! One person in the room. It's awesome because everybody else is just like, nope. I don't like the love of music. I don't like what it does to the body. Kevin Bacon tried it in that one town. See what happens. They're into a bunch of sinners. That's what they did. Fuck you and your rock music, you son of a bitch. I go to church. That's about it. I like that. Rock and, I like rock and roll a lot, right? Rock and roll doesn't exist without influences from blues, jazz, R&B, and gospel. Is that interesting? Yeah, gospel. Rock and roll is called the music of the devil, yet it's been inspired by the sound of the Lord. Every church should be playing Led Zeppelin. <laughs> Every sermon should end with a stairway to heaven, <laughs> which is arguably the most Christian song ever written, <laughs> because the stairway to heaven is, <laughs> fuck, I can take a highway to hell and get there in about 25 minutes. <laughs> is that a bitch? Good devout Christians go to church every single weekend just for that hope to ascend to heaven and meet God. And when they get to the afterlife, they gotta take a fucking stair to go all the way up to eternity? I don't know how long that goddamn stair is gonna be. I'm gonna take that car right down to hell is what I'm gonna do. It seems faster. I wanna wait around for the afterlife. Maybe God and Robert Plant can get together and figure out what an escalator looks like. And at one point, we mixed rap and rock together and holy fucking shit, people lost their goddamn minds. Even rap music is amazing, isn't it? I love rap music, too. Rap doesn't exist without influences from disco, R&B, and gospel. <laughs> that means Kanye West should be thanking God instead of thinking he is one. Yeah. Is it just me, or does it sound like God probably has a pretty kick-ass record collection? <laughs> Yeah, and it's going to be a record collection. God is probably a hipster. <laughs> Nobody knows what God looks like. He can have a man bun, right? <laughs> Big bushy beard, probably a plaid robe. <laughs> Tight skinny jeans underneath that plaid robe. Probably a hipster. I think living in our bubbles would get kind of boring, wouldn't it? Everybody just agrees with you, pats you on the back all the time. Ugh. Human beings are dramatic creatures, aren't we? Yeah, we love some drama. That's why we love a hot piece of gossip. You ever get a call from your friend that's like, hey, let me tell you some shit that Becky did this week. <laughs> like, yes, cancel all of my appointments. I know exactly what the next eight hours are going to be. What that dumb bitch do this week? <laughs> Excited. That's why we love reality TV, don't we? Let's watch the misery of others for a few minutes so we, can forget about yeah, so we can forget about the misery of our own lives. That's why soap operas make millions of dollars every single year. And you don't even have to watch them in the language that you speak. You just have to pay attention to the eyebrows. That's where all the drama is. Realistically, that's why we don't get angry when our racist Uncle Lenny shows up to Thanksgiving dinner. The second he walks in through the door, you're like, hey, Uncle Lenny, what do you think about the Muslims? And then you just sit back and watch the fucking theater. <laughs> it's exciting! No one really knows what Uncle Lenny thinks about the Muslims, because he's done gone burnt off his eyebrows from last year's Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> Do it with family members we love, too, don't we? Get in dramatic situations with them. I'm a big fan of my grandmother. My grandmother's an adorable little woman, right? She just turned 75 this year. Moved to the States earlier this year, too. Yeah, she moved to... Yeah, thank you. That's awesome. She made it. She made it. <laughs> she 
got through that shitty system we call immigration. I'm Indian too, so I recognize. Are you? All right, right on. Cool. Yeah. Thank you for also being here. <laughs> That's exciting for other Indian people. There's seven billion of us, but we're all concentrated in one fucking area, so when we all like disperse, we're like, holy shit, you made it. You made it. How'd you fucking get here? Did you take the flight? Did you also sit on an airplane for 18 hours breathing the same air as everybody else who seems unsanitary? My grandmother's amazing, man. One of the most adaptable human beings I've ever met in my entire life. Right? First time she came to the States was a couple years ago. She was like 68, something like that, right? Very excited to come here, right? And she wanted to see all the American things. We took her to the mall, and we're driving home, and she's sitting at this. That's the most American thing we can think of to show. Right? A McDonald's? She's Indian, sweetheart. I can't take her to a burger joint. You already heard me say that shit about God, right? I already sealed my deal with the devil. Which just seems like it's more fun, right? But, like, taking my grandmother to McDonald's and be like, this is what a GMO double hamburger looks like. That's pumped with a bunch of chemicals. Is I'm just like immediately they'd be like, all right, come on down. You gotta let's take you down to hell. <laughs> we got the car waiting outside. It only goes 80 miles an hour. Buckle in. <laughs> uh, we took her. She was, we we drove home together, and she's uh, uh, talking to me about some movies that she had seen. Right, and she's very excited. She was excited to see all these movies, and she was seeing these movies to do research because she figured Hollywood had all the facts. Right, she starts talking to me about iRobot. It's like, oh, that's a good movie, Grandma. A lot of great themes are addressed in that movie. A lot of great themes about automation, about the robotics industry, about singularity. What happens when we start approaching the singularity, right? What happens to crime when we start approaching the singularity? Do the three laws of robotics even matter at that point? Do we treat them like real people? Do we have to adjust the three laws of robotics? A lot of great themes. Good choice, Grandma. And she looked at me and she goes, yeah, I mean, there were like some pretty great action sequences in that movie. <laughs> I was like, yeah, there were some pretty cool action sequences in that movie. And she goes, really good acting, too. I was like, yeah, very good acting in that movie. She goes, Will Smith! <laughs> she like, yeah, Will Smith is a pretty good actor. And she goes, no, I'm just saying, you know, Will Smith, he's a pretty good actor for one of those. And I was like, ooh, we don't. <laughs> we don't need to add words to that sentence. <laughs> feel like that sounds pretty good as is, right? I mean, grammatically, it's garbage, but it's fucking gold. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but she didn't. She kept going. She looked at me and she goes, Will Smith, he's a really great actor for one of those Negroes. And I was like, oh, fucking shit. Oh, God damn it. Oh, you're the good one. Never forget that you're the good one. You're always going to be the good one. Oh, fuck. Uh, Grandma, you can't. You can't say that word here. Just do me a favor and just don't say that word. It's not a good word. You just don't. Please don't say that word anymore. And she was very confused. She was like, I don't understand. I don't understand what I said. I, I was complimenting him. You know, I think he's a very talented person. I think he deserves all the accolades that he's received. I think he deserves more success. I think he should be a bigger actor. He's very talented. I wasn't insulting him. I don't understand what I did wrong. What did I say? I was like, hey, Grandma, you just said a word in the set. You shouldn't say that word. It's a bad word. People get mad at that word. Just don't say that word. And she kept asking me, right? And she kept asking me. And she kept going. And I didn't know how to explain 300 years of racial oppression to my grandmother because we only had seven minutes to get home. And that's a 14 minute conversation, man. <laughs> <laughs> she kept at, we, asking me, right? We pulled into the apartment. She keeps asking me. And I go, fuck it, Grandma. We're watching Roots. <laughs> <laughs> 14 hours of oppression. Here we go. I sat outside my apartment and explained to my grandmother that that is a loaded word. That is a word that has a lot of history behind it. A lot of history of hatred, of bigotry, discrimination, right? And a lot of people associate that word with that part of history with, of this country, right? And a lot of people that associate the, that word don't like being labeled that word. And I think one of those people is probably Will Smith. <laughs> At age 68, my grandmother learned something. She learned something completely new, right? Because in her bubble, that word has no meaning. It has no historical context. This is a descriptive word, right? And she came into a completely new bubble that she did not know what to do with and learned something. 
At age 68, she did that. So it's definitely possible. Yeah. It's definitely possible for us to cross-contaminate our bubbles. Yeah. That's what we get when we cross-contaminate our bubbles, right? We get to learn what we don't want to be. We can look at an ideology and say, you know what? I'm glad that's there. I'm glad I know it's there, but I don't have to be a part of it. I'm going to go on my own path, and I'm hoping that person figures out how to have a little bit more acceptance and love in their heart, you know, have a, have a little bit more of an open mind. And when they get there, I'll help them out on their journey. I'll wait a little bit. We can look at the state of Indiana and say, hey, maybe you shouldn't elect another fucking Klansman as your governor. <laughs> you should take a hint from Alabama. <laughs> Which, to be honest with you, I'm just as surprised to say that sentence as you guys are. <laughs> it's the days and age that we live in. If we can get to that point, we can start sharing and caring about each other, right? Start sharing our drugs and tattoos. Maybe our peanut butter. I'm not sure if we're there yet. <laughs> if not, we're just going to be sitting around the room shoving crayons up our noses, and that is just going to cut off the oxygen of our brains, right? 